I'm wondering at that time, what was your vision of the future? What did you see? What you were doing then? Did you see it taking? Uh, where did you see it going? What was your future uh, idea of its direction? The work you were doing. I think that uh, from the very very beginning of our psychedelic drug research at Harvard, we knew that uh, we were on the verge of something very big. We knew that uh, human intelligence and human virtue had reached a point where uh, we would be able to uh, learn more about the brain and activate it. Um, the, uh, of course, those of us at Harvard, uh, Richard Alpert, Baba Ramdas, uh, Ralph Metzner, and the, the large group that assembled there, were not the pioneers, the, uh, the the people that were teaching us about consciousness, expanding drugs, were people like Aldous Huxley, Alan Watts, even uh, Henry Luce, the respectable conservative uh, founder of Time magazine. There was a, a large group of uh, thoughtful people who told us that uh, the doors of perception were going to open and an avalanche of uh, change would happen. So we, there was never any doubt in our minds that uh, we, we were mem members of a, of an old profession, and this happened before. It happened in the uh, 1830s. It was a transcendental movement, which again started at Harvard. Uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson, Thoreau, Margaret Fuller, the first great uh, uh, woman uh, transcendentalist. That explosive uh, movement in, of, of uh, Brook Farm, uh, but of course it goes way back. Uh, if you want to take the time tunnel, uh, the the concepts that we were working with, which is altered states, uh, consciousness expansion, increased intelligence, uh, finding divinity, and finding illumination, revelation within, it, it goes back uh, throughout human history. So we were, with the aid of people like Alan Watson and Aldous Huxley, we were. We were pretty clear that we were, uh, and certain that we were uh, riding a Niagara wave. Well, what happened with respect to the institution uh, in the sense, I mean, did you become too successful and suddenly it wasn't appropriate to to be a part of the institution anymore? Or did you, or was it a, somehow somehow become threatening all of a sudden? What, what took place there when uh, Harvard essentially uh, asked you to leave and you departed? It, it became clear to us that uh, the sort of research we were doing, which involved uh, radically different ways of approaching the brain and the mind, uh, couldn't and shouldn't be done in a prestigious, respectable, highly um, uh, establishment organization like Harvard University. So uh, actually uh, several weeks before... Uh, Richard and I were fired. I had left Harvard. I turned in my uh, my uh, time clock and uh, had, had headed for uh, Mexico, where we'd started uh, a training center. We knew that we shouldn't be at Harvard, and we had no uh, and never have had any uh, grudges about Harvard. Goodness, uh, Harvard is there to. Uh, train Ivy Leaguers to go to Washington and Wall Street and, and keep the WASP establishment going. They're supposed to be turning out new Buddhas and <laughs> a new brand of science fiction uh, neuronauts. <laughs> so it was just sort of a natural thing. Yes, we, uh, there was a, uh, there was a little drama involved in it. Uh, as I In flashbacks, I mentioned some of the um, minor political squabbling. There was a, a professor there named Herbert Kelman who kind of led an attack on us and uh, turned out later that he was uh, a beneficiary of CIA funding. He says he wasn't winning, but that doesn't make any difference. The CIA knew they had a good sound fellow there that uh, should be rewarded. So that uh, there were, but there were th political issues, uh, but they're secondary. They're kind of uh, gossipy, but the real, we didn't belong at Harvard, and uh, we uh, we set up our own institutions. That uh, throughout history, that's been true. You know, Freud couldn't get uh, a job in a Viennese hospital, and uh, Socrates got uh, <laughs> put in the, put in the last cell in the back row and uh, of death row, and uh, 
Voltaire had the head on the lamb, uh, the long head. We were pretty much aware, uh, I think all of us uh, at the Harvard Psychological Group, and, and that included about 35 of us, uh, people like Professor Walter Clark, who was a very distinguished, gray, ultra-respectable uh, theologian, the younger uh, psychologists too. They knew they were risking their careers. They knew that they were uh, maybe going to put themselves out a little too far and never able to get back. But uh, they, we had a, we, we always had a sense of history. Allen Ginsberg, I, I have a chapter in flashbacks about Allen Ginsberg coming to Harvard. And Allen and uh, people like Kerouac and Burroughs taught us a great deal too. They had the street wisdom that we lacked uh, being Ivy League Harvard professors. And Allen Ginsberg, uh, whatever you think of his poetry, is a very effective um, literary social worker. He's like a, 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 a cosmic defense attorney for uh, beatniks and romantics and uh, bohemians and hippies and hipsters, no matter what name you give them. The, uh, the, the group in every culture throughout history that have carried on the message of individuality, look within, irreverence to authority, question authority, uh, try something new. Ginsberg was uh, very aware Ginsburg told me, and I, I've, I've thought about it almost every week since then, that uh, we were part of the of the Bohemian tradition or of the avant-garde tradition that uh, had always existed. And he, he felt that um, our group included Gary Snyder, it included uh, Ken Kesey. He saw us as, as as important historically as Plato, Aristotle, Socrates, uh, and uh, we're a young country and. You, We've only been going 200 years, and I think when the history of our times is written, you're you're never going to hear the names of Nixon or Kissinger or MacArthur, or you know the you may make some mention of Roosevelt, maybe Kennedy because of the of the assassination of the romance. But the uh, Alan told us, and and I believe him, and I'll repeat it today that I think that the history of America is going to be the history of people like Emerson, uh, Thoreau, uh, Jefferson as a philosopher. Uh, Edgar Allan Poe, my God, that poor man was, you know, was uh, savaged by the media and uh, pushed around by the establishment. Uh, Mark Twain, who was a tremendous outcast, even though he was very popular. The history of America is the history of those of us that belong to this uh, this uh, wonderful brotherhood and sisterhood of uh, avant-garde uh, inner voyagers that we, we, we believe uh, that were the American tradition. And uh, so we weren't really that surprised when the, the thing exploded in the 60s. We, we, that's what we had signed up for. I recall something in the book you mentioned about Aldous Huxley, and I believe there was somebody else whose name I can't recall, and Aldous was saying that uh, he thought you were a little too conservative uh, in your approach. Yes, that uh, uh, Humphrey Osmond. That's the, it, Humphrey the, Osmond. The brilliant uh, British psychiatrist who invented the word psychedelic had been conspiring with uh, Huxley, and the two of them came to Harvard, and they kind of checked me out, and uh, they they were hoping that we would do pretty much what we did. I think we probably carried a little too far, or, or events carried all of us farther than we expected, but uh, Huxley uh, and Osmond, after the dinner with me, went, well, he's a nice guy, but he's a little too straight, and uh, maybe we can loosen him up. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you mentioned Alan Ginsberg. He had this idea of... Uh, traipsing off to New York on weekends and turning on uh, as many of uh, his associates and friends as possible. And there were some fascinating stories that you were related in the book about those kind of those experiences. Well, as I say, Alan has always been a, pol a politician, a cosmic politician. He was the first person to point out to me the uh, insanity and cruelty of the drug laws, the treating uh, people as criminals for uh, trying to alter their conscience. He was a a tremendous crusader and always has been anytime anyone was in jail god knows how many times alan bailed me out or got uh, signatures and petitions to help me out of the various uh, dungeons that the uh, establishment put me in so uh, alan uh, said that our strategy should be uh, one of uh, turning on important people in uh, literature and poetry art uh, music so uh, he had i remember it was about 21 years ago today in my uh, dining room he pulled out his battered leather uh, address book and there in his tiny little ginsburg scrawl he had the names and addresses and phone numbers 
of the who's who of American art. Uh, and then he'd give me a ring, and uh, uh, in the middle of the week, and I'd go down <laughs> uh, from Logan Airport on the Boston to the New York shuttle with uh, my little bag full of psilocybin pills. And Peter Luskin, Alan, and I would uh, go around uh, uh, New York uh, turning on uh, the famous, distinguished, uh, successful uh, people in the arts. The, the idea was that if we turned them on, they could tell us what they experienced because we were novices. They could, in turn, uh, uh, teach other people uh, about this, and uh, we thought that um, the, um, the movement would grow that way, and certainly did. Timothy, if you were back in the 60s now, would you do anything differently than you did then? Oh, Michael, it's, uh, that's, of course, the big if question. Wouldn't we all do it differently if we could do it? You know, if you go back to your senior prom, it would, uh, um, I've, I've given this a great deal of thought, and I've been asked that question many times. Uh, basically, we were out there doing our best uh, on a frontier that had never been explored before our, our hearts were pure and we uh, we the, I think we on the big issues um, we always did the right thing one thing I kind of regret is that uh, we were a little blind I didn't understand the importance of the new generation I didn't realize demography that there were 76 million kids born between the years 46 that's post Hiroshima and 1964 double the birth rate 40 million more than we expected now the impact uh, of doubling a birth rate in a country like America is, is simply enormous and of course this generation was not only different in size it was different uh, in their basic reality imprints as parents of this generation we you know, it was Dr. Spock, it was demand feeding, it was treat them equals, treat them as individuals, don't force them into that had never been done before to kids. That's almost unheard of. And when the right wing reactionary and left wing reactionary people uh, later on blamed Dr. Spock, you know, of some they were right. It was of course Dr. Spock was simply a, a vehicle, a, a, an instrument for genetic history unfolding. But this we we hot shots at Harvard and we philosophy PhDs really didn't understand that this generation was going to sweep through American culture like a, a tsunami wave, changing everything, including us, and it just swept us right out of Harvard and it swept us right out of any illusions we might have had of slow change. Uh, I I think that. Um, if we caught on to this quicker, uh, we probably would have warned people in the late 60s that the LSD they were getting was not pure and that there was a deliberate government conspiracy to kind of, uh, you know, um, cloud up uh, and, and put out really dangerous drugs. I think that we, we, uh, we, we didn't understand the enormity of implications of the baby boom and... Um, I personally now feel that uh, the concept of generation, the generation you belong to, uh, is one of the most important things in your life because you're going to be swimming like a school of fish in this school of your own generation. And the kids that came up in the in the 60s, hit high school and college in the 60s and early 70s, share basic reality imprints that uh, are entirely different from Ronald Reagan and Tip O'Neill and, and even Teddy Kennedy. And... Uh, the uh, the reason that the importance of, of generation, generational demographics, demora demora generational psychology, uh, we didn't, the reason we didn't understand it was because there had never in history been such a quick generational change of that import and that numbers uh, of the baby womb. So in hindsight, if I knew then what I know now, I probably would have done something differently, but, but you can't... Um, what about your uh, perception of the establishment? I mean, in some sense, in talking about being out on the edge, you were out on the farthest edge. And have you ever thought that perhaps you took the rap for a lot of other people? Since, I mean, you got nailed and many other people didn't. Well, uh, I was very aware of that. And I think um, most thoughtful people were aware of that in the uh, after uh, Nixon came into power in 1968. 
uh, it's obvious he couldn't do anything about young people and the counterculture and drugs, but one thing he could do would be, and he said it uh, in so many words, we can imprison the spokesman. So I knew that uh, I was a uh, like a lightning rod. I knew that I was uh, like a symbol. And uh, I accepted this. Uh, it's reality. And uh, you can't complain about it or you can't uh, cry foul. That's the way the ball game is played, and uh, that's why I've never felt any resentment or bitterness. As a matter of fact, I'm rather honored. Uh, you know, I was put in the penalty box for, in the great cosmic hockey game for four <laughs> years. Well, the, the, they, they put in the penalty box the people they think are more, most dangerous to them, and in a sense, it's flattering. So, uh, um, Do you think, in, in, in reflecting on that experience, that, that the establishment learned anything from their experience with you? And if so, what? No, the establishment never learns anything. Uh, they'd start, well, they'd start Vietnam again, uh, as they're trying to do in Central America. Vietnam was, of course, the Korean War. Uh, they, they never learn anything. They're always fighting the, the last war because you can't learn. Uh, once you've been imprinted in, 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 um, in adolescence, unless you deliberately try to uh, re-imprint and change, you, you can't learn. You're simply going to repeat the same uh, reactions because you're living the same reality. Uh, Tip O'Neill in, in, in Ronald Reagan's uh, 60s was Teddy Roosevelt running around storming Cuba and running down with a big stick in the Caribbean and shaking his fist at Nicaragua and stealing the Panama Canal away from from the country of Colombia. So that, uh, no, they, they, they still see the world in those terms and uh, they... Uh, they can't be expected to to change, and, and I'm not being uh, I'm not being hostile here. It's a straight neurological fact we're talking about. What allows some people to re-imprint and change, and others not? Well, that's a good question. I think uh, uh, where you hang out uh, is very important. Uh, I think the people that you associate with. The problem with with uh, Ronald Reagan right now is that he probably spends less than two or three percent of his time with uh, kids under the age of uh, 18. He simply never hangs out with them. And if he does, there's not any sense of learning from him, you know, to perform. So that's really zero. He's getting no input from, uh, from the whiz kids. I think he spends almost no time with baby boomers, those now between the age of 18 and 36. He may see them occasionally, but it's to give a speech at, a, you know, a, a, at an organization. But to really sit down, hang out, listen, absorb, learn, exchange, interface, uh, you know, get it on with, and that the only way you can learn, these people don't, uh, and they get trapped in their um, their realities. And uh, of course, it's true the Soviet people that run the Soviet Union and China too. Look at their faces; they uh, uh, it's so simple too. If you want to change, uh, it's just. Uh, it's geography. Just just move to the place where uh, different people hang out and listen. And uh, uh, right now, I spend um, I spend about uh, oh sixty percent of my time with with people between the ages of eighteen and thirty six. My wife comes from this group, and most of our friends are. I spend about twenty percent, maybe twenty five percent of my time with uh, kids born after sixty four. This is my nine year old son, my ten year old granddaughter, my eleven year old grandson. I hang out, you know, listening to them, playing computers with them, and uh, I spend less than ten percent of my time with people um, of my own generation. Uh, I can play. I, I see uh, very clearly. Uh, that the age of the people you hang out with determines your age, and it's possible just as we, you have geographical units like uh, continents like Asia and Africa and Ireland, generations are are, are are temporal units, and you can jump generations, you can migrate, and how do you migrate from one generation to another? It's, it's time travel, just hang out uh, with people of different ages, and, and I like to take trips way back to... Uh, Way back to the 1920s, uh, I can talk World War II, I can talk alcohol prohibition with the old timers, and I love to do it, but not more than 10% of the time. You know, we, we heard about the, the uh, 60s being the um, revolutionary generation, or the revolutionary decade, and the 70s being the me decade. And What do you think is the legacy of the 60s? 
because most of that really is media hype. I mean, it's really not an accurate reflection of what happened. Well, I think it's a um, it's a mistake to focus on the uh, the the decade. You must keep your eye on that generation, the baby boom generation, those born between the years 1946 and 64, the late 60s and early 70s, was their adolescence. So it was romantic, idealistic. Uh, they wanted to shake up and change sexual mores, music, art, uh, uh, lifestyle, uh, you name it. Uh, anything in the broad spectrum of American culture was changed by these kids then. Now, the 70s was a period when they were settling down into graduate school. They were getting, or they were settling down to careers. They were having families. Uh, the 80s, uh, the uh, uh, period when this group is getting to a position where they're going to take over. You see, in 1988, there'll be an election then, I hope. The baby boomers, 76 million of them, will be between the ages of 24 and 42. So we're talking here about this generation is basically a 21st century generation. And instead of using the term baby boom, I sometimes prefer to use the concept the 21st century generation because at the turn of the century, the baby boomers were between the ages of uh, 36 and 54. They'll have the, it's their generation, it's, it's their, this their century. They're not really of this century. So they're going to, in the future, step by step, they're going to take over. And I tell you, they are different and they're going to make... Uh, America, a different uh, and a much better country. Do you think uh, psychedelics are necessary for change, for people to change, to re-imprint, as it were? Yes, I, I, I think that uh, now, this period... Um, I would be amazed if anyone would explain to me how they can really change the neurological imprint without uh, using uh, you know, the the organic chemicals that are... See, a drug that changes your brain is an access code, like the, that, those circuits of your computer. They, uh, drugs inter, interface or interconnect or, or unlock uh, receptor sites in the brain. Now, there are, there are other ways of doing this. Uh, uh, Dr. Patterson apparently has developed this electrical way of setting up vibrations to, uh, to uh, set off endorphins and so forth. I'm sure that in the future we will, we will uh, have uh, other ways of doing this. The, uh, well, the Buddhists would say they have other ways of doing it, for example. Good for them, good for them. Yeah. Uh, there's no... Um, there's um, really no cause for debate here. Uh, anyone who really, uh, if you think of the endpoints that you want to get to, and that anything that'll get you there is, 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 is it's your style and your way of doing it. Um, In some sense, if one looks at other cultures and other societies, uh, particularly um, more societies that would fit the definition of primitive, primitive um, or perhaps using the word primal. Um, and not using primitive in the sense that it's ordinarily used as being backwards or not uh, civilized or whatever. But if one looks at primitive societies, one notices that frequently they have ritualized uh, events in their lives where they use um, natural drugs to uh, change their consciousness in order to deal with various aspects of their life. And in this society, we don't seem to have any such ritual other than perhaps the stand-up cocktail party, and not much more than that. Well, it is interesting how alcohol has got so much ritual. You know, you walk into a bar room at 5 o'clock or 6 o'clock in the afternoon, it's like a, a cathedral with the glass and the bottles and the lights and the, the priest is the bartender's white uniform and the clinks and the, and the laughter and the... the the merriment of people who have just gotten off work and want to flirt or want to relax. It's a incredibly powerful ritual that has nothing to do with alcohol. But one, one, I hesitated when you asked me about, oh, did I think drugs were necessary and kind of pause for, for this reason. You, you have to ask about any consciousness-altering technique. What's the goal? Instead of talking about 
this form of meditation or that, uh, this drug or that. What are you, what are you trying to get? Uh, what is the, the end state? Because after all, it's not the drug or the technique. Although we quarrel and imprison each other and uh, divide up and, uh, and debate over the, the technique issue, the, the, the basic issue is where do we want to get? And I don't think we can discuss consciousness or drugs uh, at this moment in world history without realizing that we are changing from an industrial society to an information society. And uh, the awesome implications of this. And obviously, uh, the, the use of drugs, the fact that, um, you know, in America today, $90 billion is spent on, on illegal drugs alone. $90 billion. That's, that's like 20 times more than the entire output of Hollywood in a year. Uh, and that's just illegal drugs. That doesn't include uh, the, the illegal drugs like alcohol and nicotine and, um, and prescription drugs. Uh, it's, uh, the reason for this is not that society is going to hell or that it's for the Roman Empire. It's we're moving into an information society when a communication and when neurological uh, uh, input-output and expansion of, uh, of receptors and in, uh, better techniques of, of storing and transmitting information, th th these are the, uh, the real issues. And naturally, uh, drugs which alter consciousness, which, which uh, change your processing of information, are going to be more part of life uh, than in, a, uh, in, industrial, in an industrial society. You couldn't possibly have a big drug movement which involved individual search or individual uh, personal development. Why? Because everyone had to be there at the factory at 8 o'clock when that whistle went off and you had to work right on your job until 5 and you had to punch that clock and you had to be dependable, reliable, replaceable, conforming. Now, you, you couldn't have a, a personal growth, internal introspection, meditation, psychedelic uh, type movement in, a, in an industrial society. So the, what we call the 60s and the me generation, uh, the self-development, personal growth movement of the of the 70s, and the and the, to me the, the 80s are kind of like the the really hip, sophisticated hipster generation. I think I do a lot of lecturing, uh, Michael, at colleges, and I talk, you know, to young people. I listen to them. They're not conservative. Uh, they're, they're basically realistic, and I think they're very sophisticated, and I think they, they, they understand the 60s, they understand the 70s, and they're not uh, waving flags, but I think that they're basically, uh, you know, they've got a certain um, uh, cynical, tolerant, amused wisdom here that, uh, that uh, I think is going to be um, quite appropriate for the information society that we're generating. And I must say at this point that the, the use of, of brain change drugs or of conscious altering techniques has got to be uh, tied in to the use of computers. I've been working with, with and around computers and computer people for the last uh, two years. And uh, I'm, I'm not the first person to say this. It's almost a cliche, but computers are the 80s. What uh, brain change drugs were the 60s and early 70s. They And... You know, you talk to people and they say, well, I use a computer to it saves time or because it's more efficient. That's not the issue. A computer is a, an ex extension of the human brain, and you can program computers. I'm, I'm working now with a group uh, that are programming computers to, to think like selves.